Hello, and how are we today? Well, the Walt Disney Company is a very interesting company in that everybody has a different personal connection to them. I myself, you ask me what tends to come to mind when I hear the word Disney, Christmas tends to come to mind and we'll cover that eventually. And video games tend to come to mind, which I actually already have shown in the past. But another thing I find unique about the Walt Disney Company is that no matter what part of the company you're talking about, the media does tend to have this familiar quality to them. You don't watch something made by Disney without going, this feels like Disney. Even when they try to be experimental and do something different, there is that weird bit of familiarity. Not that that's even a bad thing, it is nice to know what you're getting into, even if sometimes you can't know what you're getting into. When I see the ranking videos for Disney stuff, and I'll see the ones that just cover one little specific era of the animated canon, you know, hey, that's fair, that's pretty simple. Sometimes people go a bit beyond that, and they'll cover all of the animated canon. Again, that's a good video. Then some will go even further. They add the Pixar stuff in there, or make a separate video with the Pixar stuff. Again, I like where this is going. And then when we go even further than that, some people are willing to do the direct-to-video stuff. Which probably aren't as infamous now, but still don't tend to come up as much. But it does happen. So why don't we have Disney ranking videos that do the entire company? Dead serious. Why aren't there a series of videos doing every single film created by the Disney company, no matter which part of the company made it, comparing them all together? And that's what you're watching right now. Yes, as the title of the video shows, and especially the thumbnail shows, I'm still starting at the very beginning. There's no other better place to start, and trust me, it took a while to come up with that. I may have wanted to be different, but you just have to start at the beginning. I'm not stopping at the animated canon. I'm not stopping at Pixar. I'm not stopping at the direct video sequels. I'm also covering the MCU. I'm also covering the new Star Wars stuff. I'm covering that period of time they owned the Miramax company. I'm covering Buena Vista's videos. I'm covering the live-action stuff that does say Disney. I'm covering TV movies. I'm probably even covering TV specials that are feature-length or close enough. Two-parters are a bit more in the gray area. I'll get into it more in the video coming soon because that's the better place for that topic, but some two-parter stuff sounds like it should fit and some stuff sounds like it doesn't, so I may need some help on that one. But anyway, we'll start off simple enough. Let's look at the golden era of Disney animation. The first thing I want to say is, I'm really glad we're out of that weird period of time where people were dead convinced Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs was the first animated film ever made. I'm aware that there is now a debate on if it's the first hand-drawn full-length animated feature. And from what I understand about that, the consensus seems to be it probably isn't the first of those either, but any that existed before Snow White is now sadly lost to time. And if you're wondering why the designation is now hand-drawn, the films we found from before Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs tended to be like The Adventures of Prince Ahmed, which was done with paper cutouts. Because this was the first film by the Disney Company, well, think for a second about what the Disney Company, which I'm not even sure entirely was a company at this point, what they were doing beforehand. Walt Disney and his crew were making animation, and they were making it for theater spaces. They were making theatrical shorts. And that is what brings me into my one criticism of the movie, is that the script does kind of feel like people who didn't know how to write something that was an hour and a half long. That's the most shocking bit. The shorts were short. They felt short. They were short. 
they jumped into an hour and 26 minutes. <laughs> that feels a bit of a stretch. I'm surprised they didn't try to shoot for 40 or 50, because that still would have been a feature length. But because of it, there's just some scenes that don't advance the plot at all. And it's not necessarily entirely a bad thing. The jokes can actually be pretty funny in this movie. And the Walt Disney Company is well known for their great visuals because they make great visuals. So having a scene that's just an excuse for some really great visuals is not that bad a thing. The only other thing that comes from that criticism is because they were used to writing characters for shorts. Shorts characters tended to be a bit flatter since there's not much of a reason to fully develop these people that you'll only see for five more minutes of your time. So because of that, a lot of the characters in Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs technically you could call two-dimensional. But even then, that's not entirely a bad thing because of one fact. The genre. The genre of this movie is a fairy tale. A genre filled with very simple characters because they're archetypes. It's a plot that you already know going in ahead of time and characters you're supposed to immediately recognize because they're archetypes. Don't get me wrong, it still makes it a bit weaker than some other films, but for a movie as old as this, it's really good. Besides, even with the two dimensions of the characters, there's enough to like about all of them that you're going to end up finding that one character you like so much, you will insist with your dying breath, they're the one that is three-dimensional. Mine was grumpy. He starts rude and selfish, he's taking none of this, Throughout the movie, he actually grows as a character. He becomes nicer and softer, and he cares about what's going on. Character development for the only character. <laughs> Look, hear me out, okay? He has better chemistry with Snow White than the prince does. The prince doesn't even have a name. Okay, that might not be true. Now, these are ranking videos, as I discussed, and they're movie reviews. Online, there's a bit of a, I wouldn't call it discourse because no one's arguing about this, but there's a bit of a suggestion, a trend, I'm not sure what to call it, but a lot of reviews these days online are blurring the line between review and video essay. And I like both things just fine. Uh, the problem is that reviews are just supposed to be one person's opinion on the thing they're reviewing. It's nice when they know some other side stuff as well, but knowing tons of side stuff is integral to a video essay. Kind of side important in review, in fact, not even always needed. So if you're coming into these hoping that I spill a lot of info on these Disney films or really dive into animation history, I'm actually going to try to avoid doing that a lot just because I'm afraid it will kind of force my opinion on some things, as I would rather just rank every single video from Disney, which, yeah, this is gonna get unfair sooner than later, so I might as well leave trivia out of this. Still, if I know some trivia, I'll share it. Even if I'm not entirely sure of the validity of that trivia, but I'll at least tell you if I don't know how valid it is. I don't know if I can back this up. I don't really remember where I heard this from. I swear one of the Disney Nine Old Men shared this, but I could be wrong on that. Apparently in the original drafts, the princess's name was Florian. And if that's true, I see why they didn't keep that. Because if the audience had heard the name Florian, they probably would have been laughing throughout the rest of the film's runtime. Let's go on to the Evil Queen. Who again, quick trivia, I can't necessarily back up. I believe her name might have been Grimhilda, but again, don't quote me on that. The biggest trend that stays from this movie onward is the big bombastic villains. And for being one of the first, she's still one of the best ones. <laughs> like all the other characters, she lacks a bit more depth than you might be used to, but that's honestly her biggest strength. She's just evil. There's no big grand reasoning, she's just petty and spiteful because she's evil. When she's more serious, it tends to be more dark and creepy. And later, when she gets to really let loose, she's just having so much fun being evil that it's a blast to watch. So 
So as the very first Disney full-length animated feature, it's still really, really good. <laughs> it's more on the enjoyable end of the spectrum than deeply emotional and raw, which a lot of Disney films have been very good at in the, you know, almost a century by this point. <laughs> But fun and vivid are definitely not bad things. I mean, if anything, maybe that helped this movie age as well as it did. I genuinely couldn't believe how much the film held up when I saw it not that long ago, and then on the rewatch again here to make this list more accurate. That being said, when it comes to the star rating, it's a low four stars. It's good enough to be four stars, but you know, there's times where it's kind of only just barely reaching that four stars. So I don't think I made this clear just yet, but there will always actually be a list. Linked in the bottom of the description for all of these videos will be a letterboxed list. And that letterbox list will have all of the movies from the video series. Like I said, it's everything. Does that mean the list will be kind of unfair? Well, it also means it will be kind of fair if that makes any sense. There'll also always be an end graphic where, for the ones like this, where there's a bunch of movies, that actually does explain which movies I did think were better or worse for just the ones featured in that video. But to make the point I was trying to make, here's a quick rule of thumb about that. Because Snow White is at four stars, but a lower four stars, any movie that rates higher than that in the letterbox list, consider those to be the essential viewings for the company, at least in my personal opinion. Look, if you're an animation buff, an animation historian, Snow White's necessary viewing. There's stuff you can really only appreciate if you understand what went on and what has come since. But for just the casual person who likes Disney films, or just for someone who really wants to know what is the top tier of this company, anything that ranks above Snow White. That's the stuff I recommend to everybody. No matter what their personal taste may be, it's the stuff I think the most will appeal, no matter who you are. And sure, some of it will just be the stuff I like the most, but there'll be reasons I like them the most. <laughs> so at least there's that. So I figured since I'm recording on different days anyway, hey, let's give you guys a change of location. You uh, get to see the fridge that sometimes makes sounds, so I have to turn it off. And you also get to see that I eat cereal. What a fun fact. So Pinocchio being the second film in the company's catalog kind of instantly changes things up really drastically. Snow White's really good and is aged really well. Uh, the amount that Pinocchio beats it though is a pretty wide margin. So if you aren't aware or if you have just forgot, Pinocchio is the Disney film that started the trend of following your dreams, wishing upon a star. I don't really think that that trend has kind of stayed all that much. More modern Disney films have kind of poked fun at that one and deconstructed it really hard, which is why in re-watching it, I realized Pinocchio started another trend that we've kind of all forgotten started there, even though it's probably the trend a lot of us associate the most with Disney films. Jiminy Cricket was the first Disney sidekick. You know the Disney sidekicks. Funny, goofy characters, and yes, characters, sometimes there's more than one. Let's take, for example, The Little Mermaid, where Sebastian and Flounder are the Disney sidekicks. And Jiminy's definitely a singular character. And he's also kind of still one of the better ones all these years later. He really fills it out. A lot of his dialogue is very jokey and comedy-based, believe it or not. And when it comes to how useful a character as he is, he's definitely a plot point, but he kind of doesn't help all that much, which is not a negative on the character. It works that way. If Jiminy could always get Pinocchio out of trouble, well, how do you have conflict in the movie? 
end of the day, I still think Jiminy is probably one of the better ones, and I'm kind of surprised he's no longer that much of a mascot for the company. And I'm a lot less surprised there was a time he was one of the mascots for the company. Also, if you really want to be surprised, Jiminy's a lot more thirsty than I remembered. As I live and breathe, a fairy. Mm -hmm. Snow White didn't really have the raw emotions that a lot of the later Disney films had. Pinocchio definitely does. There's a lot of this character's plight, and also just characters like Geppetto, that you really do get the emotional discourse out of. And speaking of, they're not two-dimensional this time, because the script is more like a traditional movie, or at least traditional by today's standards. There's a lot more character depth in there, and some more character development. Which is not just jaw-dropping, considering the last film failed to do that all that well, it's even more jaw-dropping if you've read the original story. This is something I'll be able to do, not all the time, but fairly regularly. I'm the kind of guy who's read a lot of source material for some stuff. I'm lacking in the fairy tale department, hence why I didn't bring up the original Grim Tales or anything like that for Snow White. But I have read Pinocchio. And the original Pinocchio was kind of an incomprehensible mess. An enjoyable one but an incomprehensible mess. See, from what I understand, on my admittedly limited research, Carlo Collodi wrote Pinocchio as your pretty standard typical moral tale, you know, hey kids, listen to your elders and don't be a brat. But then Pinocchio would get his final come up into the story, and Collodi got a lot of uh, mail saying how much they loved the character and couldn't wait for his next adventure. Which meant he just kind of haphazardly got Pinocchio to survive the encounter. Just so he could learn the lesson again. And then he still got messages saying they loved the character and wanted to see him back. So considering just how absolutely messy that story is, it's great how this movie gets all the fun from that tale, heightens it, and makes the story make a lot more sense. In fact, I enjoyed Pinocchio as a character enough that I have actually watched and enjoyed other Pinocchio-related media. But the Disney one is still the best one. It's a surprisingly funny movie. I, I did enjoy the comedy in Snow White, but I think Pinocchio does similar ideas, but much better. It's wholesome, just like the other one, although there's some more clever jokes here. Gee, you're funny. The villains are also something else, and this is one of the few movies that breaks a trend for Disney. And I think broke a trend for the rules of movies at the time, too. The villains get away with everything. Honest John, after he sells Pinocchio the second time, we never see him again. He's a rich man for all we know now. The coachman definitely gets away with it. Stromboli, we never see him again. Sure, he lost Pinocchio because he escaped. He didn't lose the money he made that night, and he still gets to be a big jerk of a puppeteer. And if you count Monster as a villain, there we go, there's the one comeuppance of the movie. It's, it's still fairly surprising that the film is just okay with that. Congratulations, kid. You just learned a hard lesson. Sometimes con men get to con another day. I can't really sell how much I feel about the movie. <laughs> it's really, really good and such a surprising upgrade from a movie I also liked quite a bit. So yeah, we're only one movie after, but uh, here's one of those movies that is going to go higher than Snow White on the list, so Pinocchio's Essential Viewing. Oh, and uh, before I go, just one more thing. Call me immature. Call me juvenile. I love that this film has three, almost right back to back, uses of the A word. He'll soon make a jackass of himself. Make a jackass out of yourself. A jackass? Can we bring that trend back, Disney? Can we please have people calling each other jackasses in your movies a lot more?
So this bit is actually recorded, well, before the second you just saw. The way I want to do these videos is, you know, I watch the film again, get my bearings on it, write a script that I, I actually don't really read them, I just kind of remember what I wrote down, and then sit down and talk about it. And with some films, that's a little bit easier than others, because for some, I've seen before. So even though I do still have to rewatch them to really make sure I'm positive on my opinion, I kind of know what to already say. I mean, after all, at this point, I only rewatched Snow White. And I can already tell you, I remember I know I like Pinocchio better. That's just it. Also, my thoughts on Dumbo and Bambi has actually been much longer. And I don't want to spoil the opinions, even if, who knows, I might be wrong on the rewatch. I've never actually seen Fantasia. It's been on my list for a very long time, and I'm a big animation person. You'd think I would have gone around to it. Although, granted, <laughs> I've never seen these either. Cut me a bit of slack, though. I've seen When the Wind Blows. Come back, you stupid bitch, and get in the shelter! Fantasia's just a difficult beast to kind of cover for me. I've heard so many things about it that... Well, to be honest, you can never really have an opinion of a movie before you see it. That's just almost impossible. I know what Fantasia's about, and none of it sounds bad or anything. It sounds like a pretty good movie. But I've been so hesitant to watch it because I've heard so much pretentiousness about the film. Not even about anything it does, just the way some people describe it. I keep hearing, oh no, this is absolutely the greatest film the Disney company ever made, and sometimes that's all they say, which doesn't really help anybody. I've also heard this phrase, this is what people think on a subconscious level when they listen to music, and I swear I'm gonna bust an artery if I ever hear someone say that again unironically. You have no idea how subjective that phrase is despite how objective you are trying to make it. It's just visuals set to music that the people who made the movie think fit that music the best. You don't have to get philosophical. I've only ever heard this pretentious, garbled nonsense of tell the movie's more important than my existence. <laughs> if you want people, more people to see the movie, great. Just tell them what it's about. Just tell them it's an orchestra film that's more than half animated. It's like, it, it's silly. Maybe I'm just being a, a bit nuts, but the way that animation historians and animation buffs talk about Fantasia made me not want to see Fantasia as much as I want to. I do still want to see the movie, and I have to tackle it for this series. And I almost feel like that's one of the reasons I did this series. So I had a real concrete excuse to see Fantasia instead of just the things people told me I am guaranteed to love about Fantasia despite the fact that sometimes it didn't even have anything to do with what they do in Fantasia. Because I've already had a live-action segment for this segment, uh, forgive me for just pulling out the microphone and doing an audio-only version while you look at the film clips. It just feels a bit more natural and is easier for me to get this out without having to set a whole bunch of stuff up immediately after finally seeing the movie. Fantasia is admittedly a series of ups and downs for me personally. Fantasia is an incredibly avant-garde film. Admittedly, there are a few tiny things thrown in there that feel like an attempt to make sure that they don't lose the general audiences. And those bits I liked as well, as much as the avant-garde bits. It is still mostly avant-garde. And that's one of the big reasons people do adore and cherish, or at the very least, heavily appreciate and respect the film. It still feels like Disney at the end of the day, but it feels like something Disney rarely, really, really, really rarely tries to do, which is to be daring and unique and very much art piece. And I won't lie, it would be interesting to see what the present would be like if the film had performed very well. But my more cynical side also says that we just would have gotten tons of Fantasia ripoffs in the bargain bin. Alright, so I sound like I'm stalling. I like the movie. 
I quite enjoy quite a few bits of this movie. I also think some of it's kind of boring. I can get into specifics for that as well. The first half an hour of the movie is a very slow plotting pace. It's the startup. It's preparing you for what the rest of the movie will be like. So for some people, they'll get really into that and will just prepare them even more for the really bigger, grander stuff that comes along where there's actually real stories there, where there's actually characters there. Versus just fun imagery set to some music. More specifically, it's almost entirely just the Nutcracker Suite for that first half an hour. But then there'll be people like me who were incredibly bored during that first half an hour. Once the half hour is over, we get to the Sorcerer's Apprentice, and there's a reason that's the highlight of the movie for a lot of people, not just me, but including me. That's not to say the shorts after were bad. I actually still liked all the segments after Sorcerer's Apprentice. Sometimes they would still lose me for a little bit, though. They'd win me back, but they did lose me. Nothing bored me as much as that first half an hour. But that's all I can really say is my big takeaway. I get why it's beloved and cherished. And I don't like that it is oversold and overhyped by that crowd. Because I can see why some people would just not gel with this movie nearly as well as they do. As for me, I guess I'm in the middle. There's some really powerful stuff in here that did fully get my attention and that I really love. I'd love to see plenty of these shorts just by themselves. I think I would absolutely love that. But there were a few times it lost me and the entire beginning just completely loses me. It's a three and a half star. It's quite enjoyable. Maybe I'd like it even more if I saw it again. It's just, there's bits of this I don't want to see again. And I feel like even a rewatch is not gonna fix that problem for me. Still very glad I saw it, and I'm still very happy with the bits that I really liked. It's just not as good as Snow White, and boy is that a weird thing to say about Fantasia. Well, and welcome to the final location for uh, the first installment of Disney Ranked Entirely Part 1. That's the name. I'll just explain it now instead of explaining it later. Why not? So Dumbo will be recorded this way with a whole live action segment with the movie interspliced. Uh, Bambi, I'm actually going to watch it after I record a live action segment, just like I did with Fantasia. It's not entirely the same because I have watched Bambi before, but when I get to that section, you'll understand why I felt that was the best way. So Dumbo is a film I remember from my early childhood. Admittedly, that's also the last time I saw it. I saw it tons of times in my early childhood, but I haven't watched it since. I was probably 10 years old by the time I stopped rewatching Dumbo. And honestly, that might be a heavy estimate. I might have been younger than that. Memories of Dumbo are a bit foggy, but they were there. And of all things, I remembered that Dumbo was very slow and very atmospheric. And if that is what young me got attached to, adult me couldn't help but be a little bit kind of excited to see why those bits were the ones that resonated with me. I'm older now, so I can appreciate bleaker films, slower films, really powerfully emotional films. As an adult, those are easily the best parts of Dumbo, the most well-made bits. Dumbo kind of tried to kill my heart in some scenes, and uh, it succeeded. Dumbo is incredibly heartbreaking and straight up depressing. Which is very at odds with the circus setting of the film, beautifully so. Despite the fun and vibrant colors we occasionally get in the film, it's mostly sad and dreary and remarkably so. Those bits are brilliant. There's no other word I can use for it. I really have that much respect for that section of the film. Now, because it is still a film for all ages, it kind of does need to have lighter stuff. That way the kids aren't so soul-crushed. 
And I also think that it's good to have those even for the adults because of juxtaposition. If the film is only entirely bleak and dreary, don't get me wrong, it can still be completely a great movie by doing that, but by having a more vibrant juxtaposition, it can really, really help sell that even more when done right in the fridge. Don, I gotta do that whole thing again, and I like what that was too, goddamn. But that only works if the fun and vibrant bits also work very well. They don't have to work as well, but they have to work. I kind of really didn't like the vibrant and fun and comedy bits. The comedy in Dumbo is the first one where it hasn't really aged all that well for me. I just didn't find it funny. Not only that, but other than Dumbo and Dumbo's mother, I don't really like any of these characters. The elephants that decide it is completely socially okay to torment the fuck out of a baby elephant just for being born? These creatures came across as worse than the evil queen. I can't shut off my radiator like I can the fridge, so we're just gonna wait that out. And then you get the Timothy Mouse, who was supposed to be Jiminy Cricket. But imagine if Jiminy Cricket was incompetent, unlikable, and completely lacked self-awareness. When Jumbo messed up in Pinocchio, he realized that he did. He was willing to admit he was wrong, or even if he just thought he was wrong. Timothy is just kind of self-obsessed and horrible. I kind of wanted him to die. <laughs> or better yet, just not be in the movie. When I heard that in the remake they get rid of the mouse, I shed no tears. And I actually now hope that that's true when I eventually see the remake. Because yes, of course I'm tackling the live action remakes. You can't rank all of Disney by avoiding some of Disney. I cannot believe how much of a disappointment Dumbo ended up being. Especially since the bits I was hoping worked even better. It did work even better? It's a weird thing. Uh, it's been a while I've seen a movie that I can't end up calling anything but mediocre. That still has some of the more powerful scenes I've seen lately. Emotion is raw in a way the other films couldn't even do. And the ones like Pinocchio were really good at that. But it's the only one where the comedy is really not good. It kind of hurts how mediocre this one is. Uh, but I will say, Young Me really got a lot out of this movie. Young Me definitely thought the comedy was pretty good. I mean, it's very simple, stupid comedy and kids will laugh at a lot of things. And Young Me was still able to emotionally resonate with the soul-crushing atmosphere of this movie. I can say this, as an adult, I don't think Dumbo's worth your time, despite how beautiful some of the sections are. But this is a worthwhile movie for a little kid. <laughs> Kids need to be prepared for how bleak and miserable some things can get, and Dumbo's kind of a great movie in that regard. Of all things, this movie about a circus elephant is going to prepare your kid for how much the world wants to chew them up and spit them out. And I'll always respect it for that, even if... I can kind of only barely call it something kind of below average but watchable. I forgot to say that Dumbo was a two and a half out of five. I need to stop forgetting about saying the ratings out loud. So like I said, there'll be a live action segment right now for Bambi, but then I'm actually going to watch it after and just have an audio recording. Unlike Fantasia, I've seen Bambi before, and like with Dumbo, it's actually been a very long time, and I couldn't really tell you why. I don't really know why I haven't watched it again, because I remember it a lot more vividly. Here's my only prediction that I'm going to do out of all of these. Bambi is definitely going to be the one that challenges Pinocchio's spot as the current number one. I mean that. I remember it so vividly, and I remember it being more powerful, and I am pretty sure it has a tighter script than even Pinocchio did. So, it has a lot going for it already, just on memory alone. But there's one other thing that I'm going to bring up because I think it will make my discussion on this unique to just me. Did you know that Bambi is based on a book? 
Bambi A Life in the Woods by Felix Salton. Salton? I don't really know how to pronounce it, unfortunately. It's a young adult novel, actually. It's incredibly dark. It's very foreboding in some cases. And it is about a young deer growing up in the forest. Or, well, the woods, actually. You know, <laughs> it's in the title. What separates it from other books and other forms of media is that there's really nothing humanistic about these characters. This is something where the animal characters well and truly are written as if they are animals. They go through day-to-day -day life the way that nature happens. The way they even talk and some of the ways they interact with the other characters. There's something naturalistic and animalistic about it. I, I won't lie here, uh, it's actually one of my personal favorite novels. <laughs> I can't think of anything offhand that is anything like it. And I'm sure that there's something that comes kind of close to it, and I would love to read that or watch it if you'd like to recommend it in the comments section. Although, bear in mind, I've watched Watership Down, and I own a copy of the book for Watership Down. And I feel like, based on the movie, there's definitely some uh, comparisons you could do, but Bambi feels even more animalistic in uh, that regard than, say, the movie for Watership Down did. Again, haven't read the novel yet, even though I own it, so maybe that one does. But then again, Bambi doesn't have, like, uh, full-blown animal religions in it. The closest thing gets to religion is that, uh, the animals kind of view man as a malicious god in the book. I can't sell you on it enough. It's one of my favorite novels. Go look for it. Again, the full title is Bambi, A Life in the Woods, and the author is Felix Salton, S-A-L-T-E-N. Now that it's been reprinted, it's actually pretty easy to get. Uh, and your local bookstore might put it in the children's section because people know about the movie. But it's very much a young adult. The novel was at least somewhat popular enough that there is a series. Uh, yeah, th this is Bambi's Children, which is about Bambi's kids, believe it or not. Just to kind of prove how original that novel is, uh, even the sequel doesn't really capture the feeling as well. It, there's a bit of a kiddification in this, although from what I understand, there are earlier prints that are even more overly child-friendly, so it's mostly a case of just bad adaptations. But even then, this is not as hardcore as the original. And from what I understand, this is the closest it's been to the original language version. And, and if it even wasn't more of a clue that this series really did peak at the first, and there's something like the first, uh, I haven't actually even finished this one yet. But that's why I'm super looking forward to watching this as well. I already know that it's probably going to be a very good movie because I have such a strong memory of it, like a good majority of the film I can kind of recall. But since I also know what is in the original novel, I know what's been cut and I know what's been added. I personally want to see how much of the atmosphere and feeling that comes from the novel that was kept in the movie. If it's just the atmosphere and the feeling of the book, Pinocchio's gonna have incredibly stiff competition. So the thing I realized the most on this rewatch of Bambi is just how much this really feels like a culmination of everything the Walt Disney Company learned from their previous films. It mostly lacks the pacing issues that a lot of the other films had, and the script comes across as the most tightly written out of all five of the Golden Era films. Unlike with Dumbo, the fun stuff and the bleaker stuff juxtaposition themselves way better fitting. Nothing really feels out of place versus one over the other. Even if, like with Dumbo, I did like the darker stuff better. And that darker stuff, unsurprisingly, is the stuff that feels the most like the novel. Like I said, all I was really hoping for and all I really expected was the atmosphere and the feeling of the setting of the novel. The novel feels like nature, and the movie looks like nature. Some of the backgrounds just feel so ridiculously real even now. And it also understands how nature comes with a beautiful splendor just as much as a terrifying reality. The tone can turn on a dime and it can turn very sharply. And it's also done smart enough that it never entirely catches you off guard. After a while, you start preparing for it and noticing it. 
everyone knows that Bambi's mother is killed halfway through the movie. And I could end up telling when that scene was about to happen, not because of the foreboding bits just before it, but because in the very beginning of that scene, Bambi and his mom discover some grass. It's a hard winter, they're both starving, so once they have this bright spot of finding some freshly grown grass, something in my brain set off of, oh, this is the scene. I was conditioned to know that anything happy is usually the biggest warning sign of something bad to happen. And I love how the film prepared me to think that way. While I do still prefer the book, and I do still prefer what the book does, I'm not an adaptation snob kind of guy. I understand why changes are made, and in all honesty, what I look for in changes is just to see if it is made for the better of the movie. And the thing that's actually kept the most from the book is something the book barely did. The book has elements of a coming of age story, but because it really does feel like almost a nature documentary at points, it doesn't super focus on that. It instead focuses more on the setting. With the movie, it really dives deep into the coming of age story, which is why Bambi and his friends do kind of sound and act more like human children than animal children. And again, I love the novel for really not getting into that. I understand why that change happened, because it can help real children actually get more emotionally attached to Bambi and understand what's going on, really feel the coming of age aspect. So it's a change I understand, and I think is actually needed for the type of movie they're going for, even if I may like the book better. So I really do love the emotional aspects of this movie. I like how well paced it is. Except for when Bambi and his friends fall in love, the pacing really grinds to a halt in that section. So as a whole, this is one of the films I have the least complaints about, and yet it's still not my absolute favorite. Pinocchio does still win this competition, but it's a better film than Snow White, so it's definitely on the end of this is necessary viewing. It's a very solid 4 out of 5. So that is the golden era of Disney animation, and the first in my about to be very long standing series of looking at every single Disney film. And so if you like where this is going so far, hey, leave a like and leave some comments. Share the video with your friends so they watch it too. Now on the screen here, on the right you'll see my social medias, and on the left here you'll see my Patreon credits, because yes, I do run a Patreon. And discussing that Patreon is very relevant for this video because once I get enough support, I'm gonna start running polls on the Patreon specifically for this kind of content. While I definitely have plenty of ideas on how to tackle these films, I don't exactly know which ones I'm gonna do next all the time, so hey, all I have to do is run some polls so that way you guys can start voting on which ones I do next. Now outside of that, obviously if you don't want to support or if you can't support, there's no harm at all. Just like I said, like and comment and share. Thanks for watching all the way through if you did and hey, have a nice day.